Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is Early Parkinson's Disease, a discussion on the benefits of exercise and LSVT BIG. We are so glad that you joined us and we are really excited to present this content to you over the next 60 minutes. My name is Laura Gousset. I'm a physical therapist and an LSVT BIG training and certification faculty member as well as the Chief Clinical Officer of LSVT Big. I will be moderating today's session, and I am just really pleased to have an expert uh, in LSVT Big with us today. She is also one of our LSVT Big training and certification faculty, and her name is Dr. Tammy Hefferon. And Tammy's specialty throughout her practice of providing LSVT Big has been especially focused on individuals with early Parkinson's disease. So thank you, Tammy, um, for coming and joining us in today's webinar. Before we kick off today's webinar, just a few intro slides that I'd like to go through. Um, we do have our biographies listed here in case you are a, a physical, occupational, or a speech therapist and might be self-reporting your CEUs. Um, both Tammy and I have been certified in LSVT BIG since 2009 and have provided this treatment to hundreds of individuals with Parkinson's and other neural disorders. And Tammy now um, is a full-time professor at Franklin Pierce University and also co-owns a cash-based physical therapy practice with her husband in the Phoenix area called F Impact Physical Therapy. So in terms of logistics and introduction, um, you will notice in your control panel that there's a section entitled handouts. In that, you can find the PDF handout of today's slides. So that in case you wanna download that and print that or save it for permanent reference, you sure can. Uh, you may have already received the handout via email prior to this webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, we will have a question and answer time. Um, it'll be short, but you can start to present your questions now by typing them in to the question box in your control panel. We will stockpile those and hold those until the end of the webinar when we will answer as many of the questions as we can. At the end of the webinar, we'll also go over other ways that you can ask questions such as raising your hand or emailing us later after the webinar is over. Right now, all of your microphones are muted so that there's no background noise um, from the attendees from wherever you may be joining us from. Um, at the end of the webinar, if you do raise your hand, we'll unmute your microphone so that you can ask your question out loud if you'd like to do so. So the the main um, gist of this webinar is going to be a presentation discussing the use of LSVT BIG with people who are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. We'd like to include this information on how to self-report CE activity. In case you are a physical, speech, or occupational therapist who is joining us for this public webinar, um, you may request a certificate of completion if you attend the full webinar. Um, please note that licensing requirements for CEUs do differ state by state, so please check with your state licensing deport board to determine if they accept um, non-registered CEU activities. Some disclosures briefly. Um, both Tammy and I have a personal preference for LSVT BIG as a treatment technique, and financially we receive consulting fees, and I am an employee of LSVT Global. The learning outcomes are these. After finishing this webinar, we hope that you will be able to list how early exercise and therapy interventions help the brain to change in positive ways. We'd like you to be able to list how early therapy leads to better mobility and quality of life in persons with Parkinson's disease. And lastly, describe how LSVT BIG can help people with Parkinson's disease. So with that, we're going to kick off our first polling question because we really love to see who is attending our webinar so that as much as possible, we're able to really customize the, the delivery of this content to, to you um, based on who you are. So if you'll just give me a minute, I will um, open up this poll that asks who you are. 
And it looks like maybe this pull, there we go. I thought it was going to cooperate, but it is. So we'll give you about 20 to 30 seconds to answer this question of if you're a person with Parkinson's, a caregiver, a PTO to your speech therapist, a different medical professional, or maybe just someone else that's joining us. And we welcome really everyone to these public webinars. I'll give you just a few more seconds here. It looks like almost everyone has had a chance to vote. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now. We're almost 100%. Thank you for participating in this poll. And I'll share it with you right now. And I think you can see the, the nice response here that 30% of you are a person with Parkinson's disease. So thank you for that. 4% uh, is a caregiver, family member, or someone. Um, that has relation to someone with Parkinson's disease. 58% of you are a PTO to your speech, and 8% are other. Okay, so with that, we're going to kick off the topic of exercise and Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to be interviewing Tammy, our expert therapist. And Tammy, if you can just unmute your microphone so that you are ready to roll. Um, Tammy, one of the main questions that I think people have are, how much exercise do we actually need? Yeah, Laura, that's a great question. And, you know, there, it's uh, quite complex. On here, we have just the general guidelines for aerobic exercise. Um, the American College of Sports Medicine has recently, within the last five years or so, um, revise this to include not only what they recommend for moderate aerobic exercise, but what they recommend for vigorous aerobic exercise. So 150 minutes over the course of the week. So that would be 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, or if you're, if you're working at a higher level, so we would call that vigorous exercise, you could do that 20, 20 minutes, three times a week. That's only really one component of what the American College of Sports Medicine recommends though. There's also flexibility recommendations, strength rec recommendations, and neuromotor recommendations, which we'll talk a lot about later on today about especially the neuromotor component um, and how we can address that through the LCT BIG program. Okay, well, I think that's great. And one of the questions that I hear from my patients a lot is, how do you know which kinds of exercises are considered moderate in intensity? Yeah, that's a great, uh, really a great question that I think uh, there's two uh, ways we can answer that. One will give you some examples, but another one is if we just use what's called a perceived exertion scale. So from zero to 10, zero meaning that you're not exerting really any effort, 10 being that you're exerting quite a bit of effort, that if you rate your effort between a six and an eight, that would be kind of what we would call moderate intensity. So if we wanna get up higher, we would like that to be between a seven and a 10. But if we come back to what is moderate in, in intensity exercise, we might just be talking about brisk walking where it, Laura, if you and I were walking along, we could still have a conversation, although it would be labored. Uh, mm -hmm. Biking less than 10 miles an hour. Uh, ballroom dancing. So for those of you that like ballroom dancing would be great. Um, golfing is big here in Arizona. I'm not sure where everyone else is at in, in the country, but golfing without using a cart would be considered moderate intensity as well. Mm hmm Okay, that's great. Or And I'm imagining, you know, anything that kind of falls into that domain of you're working hard, but you can still, you know, hold on a conversation. Would you say that's yeah, a good Yeah, absolutely. Line? Yep. And it can be anything. Swimming, uh, riding your bike. Those are kind of easy ones to do, right? So walking. Um, but other people are going to have other interests that will that will fall into that bucket as well. Okay, so on, along that same line, what would be considered more vigorous types of exercise? Yeah, uh, that, so we, again, we wanna be working at a higher level intensity. That's why the American College of Sports Medicine lower the, the minutes of recommendation. So remember, we're talking about 20 minutes where we're working at a higher perceived exertion scale. So 
we're working at that eight or nine out of 10 scale. That would be jogging or running. Um, tennis also is included into that. Biking at a higher speed level would be a great thing to do. Um, anything like Zumba or aerobics where you're getting your heart rate up and you're moving your big muscle groups is really a great thing. And then gardening can be moderate intensity, but it can also be vigorous if you're doing heavy gardening, like, you mm. know, shoveling and things like that. Mm -hmm. And would you say if someone is quite deconditioned, they're not used to exercise that maybe even brisk walking could be vigorous for that person in particular? Um, it, it could. It would be probably more beneficial if you did brisk walking in involving hills where you're getting maybe a little bit uh, of that increased motor output with mm -hmm. that um, okay. rather than just, you know, flat ground or flat treadmill. But yes, that can still be for a novice exerciser. It could still be considered that. Okay. Well, another question I think we hear a lot as therapists um, and also caregivers of people with Parkinson's is, is exercise safe for people with Parkinson's disease? Oh, absolutely. And really, it, for all of us, exercise is medicine. And, and uh, just understanding that the American College of Sports Medicine, they actually really recommend that everyone start exercising or exercise to some capacity unless you have an uncontrolled cardiac issue or metabolic issue, which Parkinson's is neither of those. Mm -hmm. um, and what was cool, and I think, Laura, you brought this up on the slide, but this is a great study that was done that looked at high-intensity treadmill training compared to a moderate-intensity treadmill training and the effects of the overall symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And it, if we look at this a little bit more, it looked at what we called hone and yard stage one and two. So that is early um, Parkinson's disease. And what they showed is that treadmill training at 60 to 85 percent of your heart rate max, so that's more what we say moderate to vigorous, so we're getting into some of that vigor, was, was safe and it was highly effective and much more, it was significantly more effective than the control group, which work, was working at a lower intensity. Mm -hmm. So that's nice for us because it, it actually helps us with specifically, we can answer that and say, yes, absolutely, people with Parkinson's disease need to be working at that higher level. Mm -hmm. Great. Perfect. So if you had to give a general recommendation of what kinds of exercise people with Parkinson's need, what would you say? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I think exercise in general is is medicine. So but what's unique to people with Parkinson's disease is you you need it to be more task specific and specific to what we would start to see as losses of ranges of motion and not even what we would say is range of motion, but it's actually achieving full range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, so there's been a lot of great studies out there that show that vigorous exercise is good. So you can do that on a bike. You can do that on a treadmill. Um, but we, what we see to start to see over time is that's not going to actually hold off on the progression of those task specific, um, those task specific, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, activities. Yeah. Activities like buttoning and handwriting and those kind of things that, you still need that specific practice to make sure that those are getting better. Um, mm -hmm. Really, any exercise is going to be better than no exercise. But if we want it to actually be effective in treating the disease process or hopefully even preventing progression of the disease process, you, we take a look at this slide. And there's uh, balance, which we call neuromotor. Flexibility, so making sure that we're maintaining our mobility of our joints and of our muscles aerobic, which we've just spent some time talking about, strength, so making sure that we're actually able to use our large muscle groups, so that would be your big big leg muscles, that would be your arm muscles, those kinds of things for power. And then the smaller piece of the pie is what we just talked about, is really looking at what are the specific tasks that we're starting to see the ability to, to keep remaining as efficient and effective as they should be in people with Parkinson's disease. Okay. And what about the deficit specific training? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe the deficits of hypokinesia, bradykinesia? What are those kind of deficits that are specific to Parkinson's that require special attention? 
Well, I think what we understand about Parkinson's disease is that there's a weak there's a weakness of the motor system, and so if our motor system isn't as apt to be activated, then what we when we do have a motor output, it's going to be either slow in nature or actually not not occur at all. Um, so we start to see changes in gait patterns where the step length becomes smaller, the arm swing becomes absent, there isn't trunk rotation. Um, you can still walk, but it's not actually an effective walk. And, and with that alteration in that, so now we have a deficit of all the things around that gait that actually prevent now your ability to be protective when you, when you trip or when you fall. So, um, so we really do, that's one unique thing about the LSVT BIG program, is it focuses specifically on some of those bigger tasks that we don't want to become altered as we as we move along in the disease process. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. I think that's important to point out, and it reminds me of some of my patients who came in to see me and were doing um, great exercise on their own, perhaps treadmill training, but when we looked at it a little bit closer, yeah, they were walking on the treadmill or running on the treadmill, but the, their step length was really short um, and they weren't getting that full gait cycle like they like they really should have been well yeah and that I mean and also you know it's a uh, if they empirically what we see is if someone with Parkinson's disease really even with early onset if they're gonna self-select their speed they'll self-select slower than what is needed to actually make changes in the brain so <laughs> that's also another part of what why we want people with Parkinson's disease to get into physical and occupational and speech therapy as soon as possible so that we keep what what's working well keep it working well but then also address those things that are already starting to to change right right and i think we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes even more um in detail for sure so exercise gets a lot of press as being important you know overall really for everyone if you're a living, breathing human, we all need to exercise, but why is it so vital in Parkinson's disease? Well, Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease, so meaning that in the brain, our actual um, part of our brain where the dopamine, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter that helps our system, our motor system, and so what happens is that those receptors are starting to um, to not function as well. They're even starting to die off. So we know that even with Parkinson's disease, when we study exercise, it actually has a neuroprotective effect. So it starts to protect those areas of the brain. And it also helps with the um, that motor loop. So considering that, and I think we talked about this in a little bit, but if we use those areas of the brain, they're gonna stay active and there's less likely that it's going to um, die off, so we'll we'll be able to maintain function for longer. There's a lot of studies that show that exercise in general helps protect against disease and disorder. So if you're an avid exerciser, you exercise on a regular basis, your risk of getting any um, any disease or disorder is far less than someone who doesn't exercise. So uh, really, it's important to everyone, but we want to help people with Parkinson's disease maintain their independence and function and ability to work and, and play and all of those things for as long as we can. Right. It really is amazing how medicinal exercise is, um, what a potent effect, and we really haven't known that for that many years. So I think it's amazing. Yeah, the research is definitely uh, highly supportive of it. So. So many um, patients say, well, my, my symptoms are well controlled on my medications. So why now? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, the case examples that I have you are endless on people with early onset Parkinson's. That, you know, I, I do work with a lot of people who are um, young in age, so people in their 30s that have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, or that you you know you're early in the staging, so hone in your stages one and two. Those are I would say that my experts with that. And um, I have one gentleman that he he came to me like three weeks after he was diagnosed, and they did the typical. You he did a trial, he felt better on the trial, 
Um, he came to me and we did a month of LSVT big, but it was, it was like LSVT big P 90 X insanity style. So, uh, very high intensity exercise and addressed a lot of what he wanted to do as far as being a 30 year old man with two kids. And, and he was an, a teacher and, and the awesome thing, Laura, is that, um, even three years later and after, you know, coming for multiple tune-ups and things like that, he still wasn't on any medication. Um, a- yeah, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, with some, some folks that have been diagnosed maybe for a year or two that have come to me, they don't, they don't have those vast increases in medication. So they'll stay steady on their meds. And so their meds become optimized. And they don't risk some of those side effects like we see with the dyskinesias, the writhing, that kind of thing because of the buildup of all the medication. So they get to stay at that lower level of medication for longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's an important point. And we've even seen that reflected in some of the current studies, um, particularly I'm thinking of some of the Frazetta studies out of Italy. But um, yeah, that's great. So, you know, and if you look at the pathology, the neuropathology underlying early Parkinson's disease, what do we see? Is it truly early or not? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not. And and what's interesting is they ha- we now understand that there are a lot of non-motor symptoms that are much earlier. So the loss of smell and things like that. You know, there's lots of research be- out there being done to try to find an early um test to detect Parkinson's disease because what we di- what we have now, the way in which we, we go about the diagnosis is by the time people are often diagnosed, there's already 50 to 60 percent cell death at diagnosis of that dopamine receptor. And that's, uh, that's just, you know, it, it's hard because that just means that there's already motor symptoms at that stage that are, are being compromised. And we do know it's a sensory processing disease, so knowing where you are in space and that kind of thing. So we know that that is already being affected even with early diagnosis and early staging of Parkinson's disease. Um, and typically, what we we, we do know for re- from research is five to six years is the symptoms had probably started, and it just it, you know takes that that long to get through the medical system or to maybe figure it out. But I think, Laura, you and I both know that we often hear even longer than that. Oh, yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. You certainly have heard people that say, you know, I I lost my sense of smell 20 years ago. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. And handwriting. I mean, I think handwriting is often one of those things that people mm-hmm. discover. I had a physician assistant, um, young young gal, and she, that was her her number one sign that she – knew that something was starting to go wrong because their handwriting was starting to to be affected so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's great so you know when a person is first diagnosed with parkinson's disease those motor symptoms and the non-motor symptoms can be um, somewhat subtle i think as physical and occupational therapists we uh, know how to unmask them Um, but you know, what are some of those early signs and symptoms that we know are there in most people with newly diagnosed PD? Yeah, I, I think that um, one of the main things is there's a complaint of maybe just feeling a little bit slow or foggy. Um, and you, that's that really that first box on the slide is that decreased cognition. And it's not necessarily that you you can't do things or you can't function in life. It's It's more that it's just not quite as easy. Things aren't coming quite as easy as they used to. And and if especially if for early Parkinson's disease, this can be attributed to lots of different things in your life that are going on. And so sometimes that gets overlooked a little bit. Um, that decreased motor loop efficiency. So whereas you might have been more uh, vigorous, like uh, I had a patient that used to run every um, every week and he ran multiple times a week and by the, by the time he came to me, and he was it was within a year of him being diagnosed that he came to me, but he had stopped running two years prior to that. So, you know, we're talking about that not only motivation, but his motor loop efficiency had started to decrease with that. Um, I think because of some of the changes to maybe the tremors or things like that, 
that increased social anxiousness starts to come to play. And that's definitely one of the biggest things that I would say I focus on during our treatment is specific to whoever's in front of me is making sure that they can still maintain their work environment and still have that greater purpose in life and, and reduce those anxieties around some of those work functions. Would you, would you agree with that, Laura? Yeah, very much so. Yep. Um, I think also we just talked about the cessation of normal exercise routines that will also start to see just a unilateral change. So um, like you said, the subtleties of, of maybe what normal movement patterns are, and it might be not to the un you know, to the untrained eye, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But what we know is if you start to actually not swing your right arm, that starts to affect your step length, that starts to affect your ability to actually get trunk rotation. And that's really good for, you know, we need trunk rotation for the health of our spine. Mm -hmm. um, we need a normal gait pattern to, to get a good pumping action for our cardiovascular system. So we really do try to hone in on specific things that are starting to already change in our in our early Parkinson's patients. Right, agree. And and I'm just thinking back on some of my patients as well that um, if they're aware of it, they can swing their arms pretty symmetrically when they're walking, but have great difficulty um, attending to that if they're distracted, talking, you know, dual tasking, something else. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, and things that you would think in a normal 30 or 40 year old that you should still be able to skip, you should still be able to walk backwards. You mm -hmm. should be able to do all of that with with talking and with with conversation. And and that mm -hmm. those are things that we can use to kind of tease out like, you you know, the actual changes that are starting to happen. Right. Right. So in the next few slides, I was hoping you could walk us through what the evidence is a uh, general summary for exercise in parkinson's disease yes absolutely um it's there's this wonderful conference called the world parkinson's Con congress and i think laura you got to go to that last year right mm, a couple of years ago right a couple of years ago when it was important yeah time time flies doesn't it <laughs> um, so, uh, and what's what's really coming out is that we need to optimize um, our people with Parkinson's on medication first and then exercise. So what that means is that if you are um, hesitant to start your medication, but the medication is actually gonna help you move better and keep that higher level of movement, we actually want that because you wanna be able to move through full ranges of motion. and. And some of the things associated with early onset Parkinson's disease can be more of that stiffness and rigidity. And, and so using, uh, you know, even low doses of medication to help you feel better and good enough and motivated enough that to then exercise is really, really valuable. And, and the evidence is very supportive of that. Um, we're, we know that it has to have some aerobic nature to this because blood flow helps the brain function better and it, we know that blood flow and and sleep are the one of the two main things that help heal our body so mm -hmm. we need if we don't have good sleep we never get into that neural um that that it, that time frame where our body sends its troops out to go fix what's wrong you know um and, but if we don't increase our blood flow we don't we're not actually circulating um, new blood through the areas that are are damaged or need uh, need that as well. Mm -hmm. The other two main things is that it should be skill based, meaning that you really do need someone to watch you if you're a person with Parkinson's because of all the sensory deficits that have already started to happen. So that getting into a physical therapist, occupational therapist, and speech therapist, just like you would get into a movement disorders doctor is is just as important as um, taking your medication um, variety of exercise so you you know if you've been walking for 30 minutes a day your whole life we know that our body is not does not adapt to that it doesn't get better because of that um, so the variety of exercise is also important as well 
And when you work with a therapist who then can maybe get you involved in community exercises and with a personal trainer, this becomes less daunting to do that. And, and there's a lot of resources out there now for people. Great. You know, you mentioned sleep, and I, I think this is an interesting point that's not on the slide, is that exercise has been shown to actually improve quality of sleep, which a lot of people with Parkinson's struggle with anyways. Um, so it has a lot of benefits that really are broad reaching, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that you can do to help facilitate sleep, but it, it will help all of us in this day and age. I was just listening to a NPR, um, you know, uh, news broadcast about how how much of a deficit us, us as Americans have of sleep, and mm -hmm. and we all need to get a little bit better at that. So let's. That's uh, right. let's I like that recommendation. Yes. Yeah. Let's use <laughs> exercise to help us. <laughs> Um, I think many people wonder what happens in the brain as a result of exercise and Parkinson's disease. Is it that we manufacture more dopamine or really what happens? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it's not necessarily that we're, yeah, the medication kind of floods the system with dopamine, right? That's kind of one of the main, main goals of that. But what happens when you have ex when you exercise is you actually use that, so you uptake it. Um, if you just are going to sit in your chair, you're, you're not actually using that motor system, so you're not actually going to get better over time. It's almost like we're kind of trying to hold off or trying to flood the system and hope that a receptor picks up that dopamine. Um, mm -hmm. Exercise almost almost guarantees that you're going to use at least some or if not all that's uh, that's up and floating around in that area of the brain so that you will move better and those pathways that are maybe starting to die off can actually um, start to improve again and so that protective protective effect is so so valuable with that um, mm -hmm. we know too just from looking at a lot of neurological studies that even if there's a pathway that maybe has has um, been impaired or died off, our, our bodies will create new pathways. So even if you haven't exercised and you haven't done any of that, just by using exercise and getting into some of that skill-based therapy, you can start to improve on things that you even weren't good at before. So um, mm -hmm. it really is very protective in that nature. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, you know, I just think that that gives people with Parkinson's a lot of hope that, you know, my brain still does have ability to adapt and compensate for some of the underlying damage that's been caused by the Parkinson's disease. And, you know, we use the catchphrase of neuroplasticity or the medical term, I should say, of neuroplasticity. Um, maybe talk to us a little bit about really what that means. Yeah, that's uh, neuroplasticity. Just plasticity just means that we're actually going to change the brain, um, and that there are ways in which we know are effective to do that. So um, we know that as the Parkinson's um, disease process goes along, that in early Parkinson's disease, probably even before diagnosis, that exercise has that neuroprotective effect. But then as the disease starts to progress, there's neurodegeneration, and that's where neurons are, they're just being rapidly lost. And we know that Parkinson's is very individualized in how it progresses for people. Um, some people have a fast progression, some people have a very, very slow progression. Um, and I'd say what you and I see empirically is people that have exercised throughout their life typically have a slower um, progression of that. And that really comes back to that they're using those motor pathways over and over and over again so that now we're not getting that rapid neuron loss. Um, it also, over time, helps exercise just helps play that um, that uh, kind of the strongman effect. Like I'm, I am going to use it so much so that uh, those those neurons don't start to die off and that we start to improve their function. So it, it can actually help improve that. And so what we say is the brain change happens to make our our limb system and our voice system actually work that much better. And 
we also know that it helps with lots of other things our gut system you know our digestive system that kind of thing so uh, i think that's what you're going for if you want to add anything to that no i think it's just amazing like the potent effect that exercise has on our brains um another frequently asked question is is it any kind of exercise that drives neuroplasticity or does it have to be a specific type or style of exercise yeah i mean there's there are definitely key components to uh what we know neuroplasticity um needs so it's like a a good recipe for actually making changes in the brain um, one of my favorite parts of this is that it has to be meaningful. Uh, and I think that's why, Laura, you and I fell in love so much with the LSVT BIG program is because it is so specific to the individual in front of us. We're talking about what their wants and needs are. And then we're also trying to, to figure out what exercise uh, for them is meaningful. And so that even of itself lights more of the area in that basal ganglia, which is the area affected by Parkinson's. So it, it actually increases the uh, effect of dopamine being picked up by the receptor and being used. So having meaningfulness to your movements and your exercise is very important. Um, it, it also has to be specific. So we think about, I'm a ortho, board orthopedic specialist. So uh, come back to like an ACL. So a football player, he comes off the, you know, tore his ACL. And what we used to do for rehab is we would just, um have him just you know do a bunch of squats and leg extensions and leg curls and then he would go back out on the field and hurt himself and what we know now is it has to be specific to whatever he wants to be better at so it has to be specific you know football drills well people with a neuro uh, neurological disease or disorder is the same thing it has to be specific so we talked a lot about gait training like walking so we're going to we're going to work a lot on walking we're going to work on getting in and out of the car we're going to work on brushing your teeth and buttoning and if you're still working we're going to work on whatever that job specific task is so um so those kind of things it has to have a lot of repetitions to change the brain you can't just do it twice a week and expect your brain to get better it's just not going to work mm -hmm. um and then i'd say lastly and there's more on this slide but lastly it has to overload the system so our system isn't doesn't it's not going to get better unless it's there's a variety it's complex and it's challenging so that we have to adapt to that and actually improve our our system. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it kind of reminds me of uh, um, when I took piano lessons when I was mm -hmm. young because my girls are taking it now. And really, you know, I haven't used my piano skills in the last 20 years, and I've lost them by a large <laughs> part. Um, and how does that relate to Parkinson's disease? Right. I, there's probably a part of you that can sit down and you know where to put your hands mm -hmm. and you can push on the keyboard a little, you know, a little bit. You can probably play a basic song. But right. if you wanted to actually play at the level you were because you haven't been practicing it, you you lost a lot of those neural pathways that that did that. Now, if you started practicing again, you would actually probably be able to do what you did before. And if you practice diligently, you would probably even improve that. So that is the same idea behind using exercise as medicine for people with Parkinson's disease. It's to enhance whatever the current level of function is and just make it that much better so that it's not lost, it becomes more efficient and more effective. And the great thing is, is we see that all the time with, with people with early Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I think that's what everyone with early PD wants is to, you know, keep what they have right now, improve it if possible, but not lose anything if possible. Absolutely. And it's scary kind of looking down the, you know, down 20 years from that diagnosis. And, and so I would say I highly push that for everyone to go to lots of support groups and talk to people about that. Spend lots of times with neurologists just trying to get them to get every new person into um, therapy right away. Right, agree. And you know, if we think about all these key ingredients and types of exercises, um, it can be really daunting. I, I think you would agree if you kind of look at everything in this slide. So I know you and I have talked um, a lot about how our recommendation is that really um, it's the best practice that if you have Parkinson's disease to start off 
with therapy first. And maybe you could just briefly talk a little bit about that to our audience who um, might not have kind of heard that model before. Yeah, I, I think that we talked in the in the beginning that Parkinson's is very complex in and of itself in the disease and the disorder. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people that are diagnosed uh, early in life or even just in early stages that um, just trying to field all of the stuff that comes along with that early diagnosis can be can be very hard. And and we just want you to know that most of the time your therapy team is going to be essential in your journey throughout all of this. Um, it will help you to restore and, and optimize your physical function, but it will also get you set up on a program for what you need to do to maintain all those gains that you've made. Um, and to be that person to help you start to navigate um, how much do I need to do, how often do I need to do it, what types of things do I need to be doing, and that still is very specific to who you are as an individual. Also, it will help you figure out who will be worth, you know, partnering with. Like, is there a specific personal trainer that is, has been really good with um, the kind of post rehab, and that will help you maintain a lot of that function that you have for a lot longer. Uh, so we we just really highly recommend that you get into that. Um, so remember, this was on that last slide, but if you get if you receive your diagnosis, um, oftentimes you're your neurologist is going to put you on a medication and try to figure out where that is at. If your neurologist isn't advising that you go to physical therapy, just remember that you are in charge of your health, that no one really is better at kind of where you are at of, of being your advocate besides you and your caregiver and your spouse. And if you're a therapist out there, you might be that person too for, for people with Parkinson's disease. So the idea is to get into therapy to optim optimize your function because you just optimized your meds. So now we can figure out where you need to be. Then after that, you're gonna now be on your own for a while. Your daily exercises um, at home, you, then you're gonna come in to, for some tune-ups with therapy, depending on where you are at with, with your um, own uh, symptom modulation. You might you might need more frequent tune-ups or just you might elect that because you felt so good and you want someone to check on you. So frequent checkups are not bad. They're, they're only going to help you in the long run. And then you're just going to kind of stay in that. We're going to keep going through that cycle um, as you keep going through this journey. Great. And I think you and I both just love being on the journey with our patients that it's not just a one-time you know, yeah. never see you again, but it's more like see you in six months. Um, yes. See you doing. Well, and lifelong, lifelong uh, relationships, and you know, we, if you're lucky enough to have a place that offers therapy and exercise, then you just start to build a community, and that's that's equally as important. So, great, absolutely. perfect, perfect. And we already talked about a, a lot of this, but I think. Um, you know, some of these points are important to review because it is confusing, I think, to many people, really what is the difference between general fitness that you can receive in the community and physical and occupational therapy? Yeah, so, uh, you know, they did a study that showed that amongst all healthcare professionals, physical therapists are the movement experts. And if you think about what Parkinson's disease affects the most, uh, it's movement in your speech, right? And so uh, just by going in and seeing someone that is a movement expert that now has been highly trained in Parkinson's disease, this person will be able to educate you, establish a baseline. Just like if you, you, know, if you got a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease from a general practitioner, you're probably going to be shifted over to a neurologist because they're just more experts in that field. And then if you're lucky enough to see a movement disorders neurologist, they're the ultimate experts. Well, therapy really is that in relationship to your exercise or your movement routines. So that's why we really want you to get into a movement um, specialist, meaning a physical, occupational, and speech therapist. Speech will address more of the loud for you, so what, what's happening changes with your voice. Um, and then working with the general fitness population. Personal trainers are not educated in Parkinson's disease. They're not movement experts in relationship to analyzing movement. 
they're very good with exercise uh, as far as designing programs, but not necessarily the analysis of the actual movement and the and the start to the deficits that we start to see. You'll also start to see people that you know physical therapists have their masters or their doctorates. Same thing with your speech and your occupational therapy. So they've gone through a lot of schooling, and then they've also taken continuing education to be specific to Parkinson's disease to be able to treat that. So you you know if you think about what you guys are going to choose, are you going to choose someone that's an expert that's going to help you the most in the journey? I, I would hope so. We hope that you pick that and then get into your general fitness routine and keep that up. That's all good things. It's going to help you in this journey, but. Really, the main thing is, is you want someone to get in involved with you now. Great. I love that. And that, and I love the model of really, you know, pairing the two together, um, therapy and, and fitness in the community. And um, we don't have a lot of time in today's webinar, but I do want to spend some time really talking about evidence-based practice, and in particular, um, the LSVT BIG protocol for this webinar. I think many times... Um, people also wonder, you know, what kind of, what should they look for when they're choosing therapy? And if you're considering evidence-based practice, you definitely want to say, has there been research and in intervention um, that the therapist is choosing? And do they know, based on that research, that the results are lasting? And I'll turn it back over to you here in a minute, Tammy, but we know that the LSVT protocols have been um, researched over the past 20 years and um, are, have NIH funding of their research. So we do have confidence that they work. Um, but many people in our audience today might not be too familiar with these therapy programs. And so I was hoping in the next you know, five or 10 minutes, we can give them a real high level overview of what LSVT BIG is. So can you briefly describe that to us? Yeah, it's a it's an exercise based physical and occupational therapy program. Um, it's a st standard exercise protocol, meaning that it was studied um, extensively with with a with significant high level research, um, in which we really discovered the dosage and method of delivery. So it's 16 one hour individual sessions. So you're one on one with your physical therapist, occupational therapist, or speech therapist. It's four days a week for four weeks, and it's high effort. So we talked about the intensity needed for brain change, and that's really met through this program. Great. And this is a standardized protocol. Does that mean that it's a cookie cutter protocol? No, absolutely not. Um, even So we start with what we call maximum daily exercises. Those are just um, specific exercises that the researchers figured out how we could actually combat the posturing um, that that we know happens with people with Parkinson's disease. You can think that about that as like a warm up for your brain, um, and then the whole other parts of the treatment, and even include those daily exercises, all are specific to the person that is there in therapy. So if we look at this slide, the maximum daily exercises are are those on the left hand side, and those are really just to make sure that you maintain your highest level of functioning. Um, it involves Seated exercises for great mobility of your spine and of your hips, and also for your posture. There's stepping exercises, so we want to make sure that we can we can move our body through um, stepping so and maintain our center of mass to prevent falling, to make sure that we still can clear our feet when we're walking, um, function in the kitchen and in our work environment. And then there's there's two other exercises that involve more dynamic movement which help increase our cardiovascular system and also help with our momentum that's needed for a lot of our daily activities. Mm -hmm. And so, so these same seven exercises, how do you make them challenging enough with your early PD patients? Oh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty torturous, I think, with some of these things. So, um, you know, the most simple way to make them harder is you just add counting, but once you start to add in a more extensive math problems, I think patients get a little uh, more challenge out of that and maybe a little mad at you for that. Um, I made uh, one of my patients who was a fourth grade teacher and he had to teach every subject, which included music. 
So we sang down by the bay through all of the stepping exercises in front of the whole gym. Um, he was pretty excited about that. Uh, we can just make them harder by putting you on an unstable surface, adding a lot of cognitive load to that speed. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot to to drive at that output. And I'll tell you when when I do some of those higher intensity, uh, I get quite a good workout too, Laura. So <laughs> I am sure you do. I have seen some of your treatment videos. Yeah, it's pretty fun. It's pretty okay. fun. Okay. So we know that these exercises are not the end all and be all, um, and that this application to function is really, really important. But in early Parkinson's disease, a lot of times um, our patients don't have a lot of problems with, you know, basic functional skills. So what kind of functional um, activities do you tend to choose? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot that comes to mind. I was uh, treating a dignitary from the United Emirates, and one of his main things was he would have to go to these fancy dinners and be able to eat and carry on dialogue and and do a lot of different things. So uh, a lot of our treatment program was focused on on that and his functions of his job and how to, um, like we talked about earlier, reduce the anxiousness. And he had, you know, he had a significant tremor in his right hand. That was probably one of his main things. And then that, you know, the his he had kind of more of a flat affect and some postural changes. So it was a lot of specific repeated tasks for things like that. I always focus on getting in and out of the car. Um, you'd be amazed that even with very young people, it's already altered. Um, and then trying to think about other things, like are you actually getting dressed in a in the normal amount of time, or have you already adapted to put, sitting down to put your pants on? And maybe you didn't do that before. So you have any other ideas you want to add into there? No, I think those are all good examples. And I think the main thing is that the therapist has to really be a, a good listener and understand what are the activities that you do every day that are important to you at job or recreationally um, that you want to be able to still do, you know, five Absolutely. years down the road. Absolutely. Yep. Right. So um, many times therapists especially say, well, you know, why do people with early Parkinson's disease need so many sessions? Why do they need 16 sessions and so much repetition? Um, what would you say? Well, I mean, uh, uh, you can just go back to like early research on exercise. It takes 21 days to make a habit. Um, so that's the most basic answer. The other part is that over the course of the four weeks, you're really going to get to dive deeper into the functionality of the overall health of the patient. So meaning that uh, uh, with someone with early Parkinson's disease, I should be looking at how am I incorporating all of those guidelines for the American College of Sports Medicine? Are they getting resistance training? Do they even know, you know, how to do resistance training? So you, you, if you're a person with Parkinson's, you should be working with someone during that whole course of the time to make sure that you're set up on a very good, healthy, robust exercise routine that's manageable for you. Um, we also would start to work as you go later on into your sessions in working on your off times of your medication or even reducing your medication if you're working with that with your um, neurologist. Uh, we know that that repetition is key and that the changes that we want to make need that constant attention from us. So we need those 16 sessions to do that. Okay, perfect. And lastly, you know, one of the really unique points about the LSVT programs is this idea of sensory recalibration. Um, we know that there's a mismatch between um, how the person with Parkinson's perceives their movement and how their movement really appears. Do you see this in your own early um, newly diagnosed patients that even they have this sensory mismatch? Yes, absolutely. So, and, you know, I think that's one of the studies that we we often cite or talk about is that even with people that have newly been newly diagnosed that their ability to perceive the changes that they've already made in their in their motor output so gait reaching things like that that they actually don't know that they've made those changes and they don't understand the severity of that and that that is for sure one thing that often surprises people when they start to 
to get tested with us as therapists and start to really uncover some of those changes that are already being made. Right, I think that's a really um, interesting point. And um, just briefly, we know that, you know, these are some good tips for post-treatment exercise considerations of, you know, understanding what's available locally, um, what's fun and motivating for you. And Tammy, you did a great job of saying how important it is to really um, seek the advice and recommendation of your therapist who maybe already knows some of the Parkinson's um, experts that are fitness professionals in the community. Um, and we know that LSVT big um, and exercise is an investment in our health. And sometimes 16 sessions when you're working and busy um, really does seem like a lot of time out of your schedule. But when you break it down, we also know that it's less than one full day's time. There's 24 hours in a day. And your Parkinson's disease, especially if you're young and were newly diagnosed may last um, decades more. So you may have, you know, upwards of 200,000 more hours of your life and hopefully more living with Parkinson's disease. And I think um, when we look at it that way, it's a very small investment for a huge um, potential return on that. If you haven't um, started LSVT Loud or LSVT Big and are interested in being evaluated for that and Knowing more, if you'd be a good candidate for that, we do have a find a clinician tool on our website that you can search by zip code or city and state or even country if you're um, living outside of the United States to find a therapist in your area. We also do have homework helper videos, which are really, really helpful in helping you keep motivated in doing the exercises daily on your own after discharge. So, um, brief summary, and then we're going to open it up for a few questions. We know that um, in early Parkinson's disease, the pathology is really anything but early. Um, in fact, it's, it's quite advanced by that time. And we believe that community fitness is very important, but it doesn't replace skilled therapy by experts um, in physical therapy or occupational therapy that have expertise in Parkinson's disease. So we'd advise you seek out a therapist early. Um, don't wait until you're more symptomatic or when your symptoms are more noticeable or problematic. Um, your LSVT big sessions should be functional. They should be challenging, as Tammy mentioned, uh, meaningful and fun. Um, so think of your therapist as your lifelong partner in Parkinson's disease. We have a few minutes and we can stay on a few minutes after the hour if you'd like to. If you have any questions, type them in the question box on the control panel. Um, you can do that now. You can raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon. If you do that, we will call out your name so that you know that it's your turn. Please remember to unmute your microphone on your end and we will unmute your microphone on our end as well. And then you'll be able to ask your question out loud. If we run out of time or you think of questions later, just email us at info at lsvtglobal.com and we will um, answer your questions by sending them to our LSVT big or LSVT loud expert. Please also note at the end of today's handout, we have listed our upcoming LSVT loud and LSVT big seminars. We always have a two hour um, seminar where you can learn more about the LSVT programs and even practice the exercises with some of the therapists that are in attendance. They're always from noon to two on the dates listed. They are free and we just encourage you to attend these if you are a person with Parkinson's or you know a person with Parkinson's disease. And lastly, we've listed our next public webinar, which is going to be next month on the same topic, but on application of LSVT loud, the speech treatment to Parkinson's disease. So I do believe that we have a couple of questions that have rolled in. And so I'm just going to open that up. And if you need to um, leave today's webinar because you need to get back to your um, duties for the day, that is completely fine. And we thank you for joining us. So the first question is this. I've gone through the LSVT big protocol and I use it every day and exercise every day, but have really just made up my own routine. How can I find a therapist who will help me shape my regiment better? 
Um, and thank you for uh, asking that question. One of the things that you can always do is search our clinician directory. As I said, if you go to lsvtglobal.com and look at the orange find a clinician button, um, type in your zip code or, or your city and state and the search radius, and you can either choose to go back to your physical therapist or occupational therapist that you initially saw for LSVT Bay, or maybe you want to try out someone new. Um, but that therapist should really help you to shape your exercise regimen um, to suit you, to find something that um, has the right type of exercise for you to do in the community um, that addresses your needs and, and importantly, something that you enjoy that you can sustain over time as well. Tammy, anything you want to add to that question? I just think you might need to call around a little bit and sometimes there's therapists that have taken more advanced um, trainings in, in exercise specifically. So they might have a certified strength and conditioning specialist. They might even have a personal training background. Um, so sometimes that can help out as well. That's great advice. And in order to call around um, to LSVT big therapists in particular, uh, typically their phone numbers and email addresses are listed in the clinician directory. Okay, the next question is, this sounds wonderful. Well, thank you. Um, what is the average cost range and does Medicare cover part or all of the cost? And yes, Peggy, um, this is billed as we use the same billing codes that we use for any other physical or occupational therapy that's similar in nature for Parkinson's disease. Um, there's no special billing codes for LSVT big or, uh, and because of this, um, our experience as clinicians has been that Medicare does pay for it as long as the therapist follows all the Medicare guidelines and documents the treatment appropriately. Um, if you have private insurance, you would just want to check with your insurance policy to see what your therapy benefits are and see if there's any exclusions at all. The next question is on dyskinesias. Are the side effects of dyskinesia from the medication reversible at all with a change in the medications? And do you want to take that one, Tammy? Um, could you just, sorry, repeat some of that yeah. for me? Yeah. He said, are the side effects of dyskinesias from the medication reversible at all if you change the medication? Um, I, I don't think so. What do you think, Laura? I'm not, I'm be honest, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't really I, say that that's, yeah. I, I think it's a good question for your neurologist. Um, yeah. Sometimes medications are a side effect that come with being on a very high dosage, um, but there's also medications that can be prescribed that help to counteract dyskinesias as well. And so in some instances, the doctor will um, change the dosage, which can reduce the dyskinesias. But on the other hand, sometimes that's not advisable because the rigidity becomes so severe. Um, so it's a good conversation, I think, to have with your physician. Um, the next question is, do most of these recommendations also apply to those who are further along in the illness? And Tammy, do you want to take a stab at that one? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, wholeheartedly. So I think that I've seen everyone from Honan Yar Stage 1 to, to late stage Parkinson's disease and, and exercise is one of the main things that continues to help um, the quality of life. Um, it might not re have the quite the uh, neural protective effect like it did, but you still will see improvements in in uh, ability to move, and especially from a caregiver standpoint, you might actually notice less um, less work on your part as well. So, absolutely, please get in to see a physical and occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. And and just as you were saying, Tammy, about the how you can really make the exercises in the treatment very challenging for someone with early Parkinson's disease, the nice thing about the LSPT protocol is that we can also adapt positions and movements for someone that may have more mobility challenges as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. After a PD head operation. 
is it's still important to do the LSVT big exercises. And I'm wondering if you're meaning um, deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, what do you think about that one, Tammy? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't change the fact that it's still going to help you be optimized even. And that's what deep brain stimulation does as well. It helps your medication um, optimize itself. So the, the doing things in conjunction together is going to be the best. I actually worked at, with a surgeon out here to actually do therapy prior to deep brain stimulation because it improves outcomes on the, on the um, opposite end. So you, if you think about we want to optimize medicine early on, well, we would want to optimize you before you go into surgery and then also get you back into therapy. Sometimes it can take a while to recover. So, you know, using therapy to recover it can be essential. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. And one of the things that I've noticed with my clients that have had DBS is that they continue to have problems with balance, um, sometimes freezing and falls. And also their perception of movement. And I've had a number of clients that still have, um, you know, abnormal posture or even can be moving too big. And so, yeah, I think we use LSVT big, but it specifically helps those kind of residual problems that um, we still see after DBS. Yes. Okay, I think we've got one more question here. Um, and this looks like it might be from a therapist. What is the best way to justify picking up a client that is newly diagnosed with PD and does not have presenting symptoms on eval, but we know would benefit from LSVT big? Um, I just, I would say that you probably need to do alternative tests and measures. Um, if you're still doing the standard tests and measures for just people with Parkinson's disease, you're not probably going to tease that out. So you need to probably go more towards your some of your athletic tests and measures so you can tease out some more of the um, deficits that are already occurring. You can also, for all of the ones that you currently use, you can add a higher level dual task to the, to the test and measure to really ensure that um, that, that you really are figuring out where they're at. Um, I, I'm gonna tell you that I can figure out on pretty much everyone with doing some more of those tests and measures that there are deficits that you can prove that you need to do therapy with. So maybe just get a little more creative with um, diving into maybe the ortho world to figure out what maybe maybe you can include in your evaluation of those patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and in your documentation, we know that they have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, which is, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. And that is in and of itself, does help to justify the medical necessity because we do um, have the ability to provide treatment that not only improves function but maintains function um, is reimbursable in a in a condition like Parkinson's disease. And so I think you know documenting that, um, documenting what the research says about the potential that people with Parkinson's have to um, improve even to a point where they were better than diagnosis really helps to justify uh, the case for intensive therapy. And lastly, you know, we all know as therapists that at diagnosis, the underlying pathology is quite advanced already. Our reviewers that review our documentation might not know this, of course, because of their education. Um, and so I think it's um, on us to really paint the picture of all of this underlying rationale of why I'm treating and that I might not necessarily be treating um, as much functional deficits as I am helping to maintain the function that they have today through intensive exercise and therapy. Absolutely, well said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see one hand raised and then I think we are done for today's webinar this has been so fun and thank you so much tammy for all of your all of your great insights i loved loved it well thank you um, let me just see here maybe you just put your hand down because you just realized that your hand was raised oh nope i found you mm -hmm. so the person that has his hand raised and i'm sorry if i mispronounce your name is robert Sariani and Robert, do you have a question for us? No, most no. of my problems really suck. 
Apparently, my trump are also really. Uh, Robert, do you have a question? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. 100%. Okay. I think maybe not. I didn't want to be intruding on the conversation there. Okay. Well, we're all out of time for today's webinar. And again, Tammy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. And for all of you that attended, um, thank you as well. This webinar is being recorded. So if you'd like to listen to it again or share it with a friend, um, it'll be listed on our LSVT blog shortly. If you think of questions that we didn't get time to answer after the webinar, you can always email us at our website or at our email address here, which is info at lsvtglobal.com. And we hope to see you at one of our upcoming seminars. And, it, and if not, at our next LSVT Loud public webinar, which is on Wednesday, October 17th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So thank you again, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day.